Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus again today for episode three of five in our series on movies. So far this series, we've talked about how movies came to be and who invented them. It's not who you think, so make sure you go back. And it wasn't like Colonel Mustard in the whatever with the whatever, you know, it's, it's more cool than that. So go back and check out those episodes. Today, we're gonna talk about how our brains take these individual frames of captured motion and turn them into a movie because our brains do a lot of this work. And then we're also gonna talk this series about the sound of movies and the psychology behind them and also the future of movies, so make sure you subscribe so you get those. But when you watch movies, really only a few of your senses are being activated, right? I mean, with the first movies, it was really just watching them and then maybe somebody playing music in the auditorium you were sitting in. But how is it that individual still frames presented rapidly ends up giving us the illusion of motion because it's not really anything moving. Think about it. If I showed you three pictures side by side, one of a dude on the left side and one of a dude in the middle and one of the dude on the right side, that's not motion. You would assume that he walked from one place to another, but you don't see him move. However, if I do 24 pictures and I show them to you all in a row, you're gonna think that that guy moved. You're gonna watch him move, even though he, you didn't see that. You saw the same thing twice. So remember the uh, phanastikizdoscope that I can't say, the zoetrope, the praxinoscope, there's still images on a wheel or a cylinder and when you spin it, it makes moving images. Why do they appear to move? They do first because the brain wants them to do that. The brain wants us to have a stream of vision. They want things to stay smooth. It's called persistence of vision. When you blink your eyes, you don't see black for a short period of time, right? Technically, your whole world was dark. You could not see for a fraction of a second, but you didn't even notice, and your brain filters out and ignores that information. That's persistence of vision. Light enters your eye when your eyes are open, it hits your retina, and your brain sucks in that information. And it can do this a number of times every second. Um, usually about a tenth to a fifteenth of a second is how long it takes for that chemical process of image capture to happen. We're meat bags. It takes us a minute, you know, or a fifteenth of a second, really, to get that chemical reaction going. And our brain likes things to be smooth. Just keep that in mind. Second, our brain also loves patterns. We love to predict what's happening and put things together as they happened before. In 1912, a guy named Max Wertheimer described what he called beta movement. It's an illusion created by our brain. So if you took a group of still images, let's go back to that man. You know, we've got a dude on the left, a dude in the middle, a dude on the right. It's the same guy, it's three different images. If we present those to you in a row, you will think of it as a man moving from right to left. The more frames you add, the more it would reinforce that illusion. This is called beta movement because we're taking pictures of actual movement, right? There's also something called the phi phenomenon, which is the illusion of movement. So think of a stationary clock, no hands on it, just the numbers, right? If the one were to disappear and come back, then the two disappeared and come back, then the three disappeared and come back, then the four disappears and come back, you would think of it as a circle going around the clock, making each of them disappear, right? You would slowly watch and you would be able to predict what one was disappearing next, and it would be like they were disappearing around the clock. But in reality, nothing moved, nothing changed, just a bunch of images where one of the numbers disappeared. But our brain puts them together and that's how we process a movie. If I show you enough of them in a row, you can't tell the difference between that and things that are happening in real life. And collectively, these two things are called phi phenomena, which is confusing, I get it. You know, there's beta movement, phi phenomenon, and they're both called phi phenomena. Bad naming, not my bad, somebody's. Our brain picks up the world around us at some rate. Vsauce did a great video about this, so check it out. But it's not as simple as a frame rate because we're not mechanical. It's not refreshing or moving from image to image. It's a chemical process. So if we can perceive 10 to 15 things per second, because math, you know, 10 or 15th of a second, that's 10 or 15 every second, we know something has changed, but we don't necessarily get how it changed. Our eyes are moving constantly. We're blinking constantly. We're moving our heads around and our eyes are looking left and right and up and down. And our brain smooths all that out into what you could describe as kind of our own personal movie. Film 
tricks our brain and takes advantage of the weakness of only seeing 10 to 15 things a second. And of course, that all changes. I'm not saying that that's the frame rate of our eyes because it's more, way more complicated than that. And I'm not gonna get into that. Again, watch Vsauce's video. It's in depth and only looks at that. But the first movies were 16 to 20 frames per second. They were limited by the budgets of the time. More frames meant more money. But they were also limited by the arm strength of the projectionist because somebody had to stand in that projection booth for the 30 minutes of the film and turn the crank that ran the movie. And when you can only turn that crank 16 frames per second, but you can see 15, you're gonna probably see some flicker in that screen, right? Old movies tend to flicker and we run them faster now so everybody looks like they're walking really fast, but they would call these things flicks. That's where the term flicks comes from because of the flicker of the screen. If you turn it too fast, the motion goes faster. Too slow and it would slow down. So different projectionists at different movie houses would change their speeds of their cranking at different portions of the film because it would add their own like little style to the movie, you know? But once sound started and was embedded into the film, you couldn't change the rate of the cranking. So when you watch a movie today, they've kind of figured out 24 frames per second. That's the cinematic standard, 24 frames per second. If I showed you 10 images a second, you would absolutely notice. You could see it. It would look a little jerky, but you'd get it. Up to 15, you'd still notice, but between 22 and 26, you would be overwhelming what our eyes would be able to notice. You'd get less flicker. More than that, even less. However, 22 to 26, more than enough for human eyeballs. So, you get the least flicker for the price. Seriously, it's actually about the price. It was, it was not 30 or 40 frames, even though that looked better, because more frames meant more film, more film meant more money, and 35 millimeter film could support audio at 24 frames per second, so the industry said 24 frames for everybody. It's the most cost effective. Fast forward to the modern day, as camera technology gets better, we can shoot faster than 24 frames per second. We can shoot way faster than that now. I mean, there are hypersensitive cameras that can shoot hundreds of thousands, million frames per second. At 60 frames per second, you're in the realm of most digital cameras. Your iPhone can do 60 frames per second. It's very smooth. At 120 frames per second, things are happening so fast in the camera. They're capturing so many things. You can slow that down to 24 frames per second. So that's how slow-mo starts to work. You get 240 or 1,000, 10,000. You can slow things down further and further and further. But it comes back to what our eyeballs can see with the chemical process of our eyes. 24 frames per second isn't actually that clear. It's kind of blurry, especially when things move. So if I wave my hand back and forth and you're watching this on YouTube, then you would see a big blur, right? Because you're only getting 24 frames per second. But The Hobbit, that new movie, or three movies, uh, they shot that at 48 frames per second. It made it much clearer. Each image is a little sharper, and a lot of people hated it. <laughs> a lot of people hated it, because it didn't feel cinematic, whatever that means, which really just means the cheapest amount of frames for the money. More frames remove motion blur, and action scenes feel crisper, but each frame may have less blur, and we're used to that blur. It makes us comfortable. According to this incredible blog I found over on Accidental Scientists, 48 frames might even be the ideal number. So what this person did is they took the slight vibration of the human eye, uh, because they're constantly vibrating, and the distance between the cells in the fovea, the part of the eye where you see the best, and then the distance between the cells inside of the fovea, the rods and the cones, if you use the vibration and the cell distance, you should be able to perceive 83 frames a second and change. However, if you wanna be cost effective, cut it in half, 48 frames per second, it's the perfect amount, according to this guy. Go read it, it's awesome. There's something else about movies, though, that we haven't touched on in all of this. Once you were able to capture all of these frames and you can do all of this stuff, filmmakers started to realize they didn't have to do it all at once. They could cut the film, literally cut it with scissors, and tape it back together and be either closer to the subject, further away, or in a whole new location. So life doesn't do this. So we should freak out when this happens, but it turns out it's a little more complicated than that. I read this fantastic essay by a guy named Jeffrey Zacks, and he found 
Two researchers, one from the University of London and one from the Knowledge Media Research Center in Tübingen, Germany. And they wanted to find out why we don't freak out when we see jump cuts, the cuts between one place and another. So they took video equipment to remote villages in Turkey that didn't have TVs. They weren't familiar with watching jump cuts. And they showed them short movies that they'd made with their local actors and they added cuts into them and this was the first time that these people had ever seen it. So they wanted to know what they would do, how they would react. It honestly didn't bother anybody. They didn't, even, they didn't really notice. And in fact, some people had trouble following the change in the scene, but for the most part, everybody was okay. They didn't, even, they didn't even think about it. Which comes back to how our eyes process the world around us. If you move your eyes really fast to the left and to the right, you don't see a blur of motion left and a blur back right again. If you move your head back and forth really fast, you don't see a blur of motion left and right. It's sort of like your brain jump cuts it. You go from one place to another. A smooth stream, remember? Movies do affect us because we're perceiving them in the same way that we perceive anything else. Our evolution did not resolve itself to watching fictional motions. And I feel like I say this a lot, humans are advanced social primates, so when we see faces, we'll mimic them, and we see things in movies, and we start to think of them as real. We mimic facial expressions of what we watch, and just this weird ability to suck in all of this information and process it turns us into an obvious art form of storytelling. But it's not all about seeing stuff. The first thing that I learned when making videos is the most important part of making good video is good audio. And we're gonna talk about that tomorrow, about the audio on movies. Let us know down in the comments how you felt about TestTube Plus this week. Should we do any other topics? Because we wanna hear from you guys. Also, make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. I've been looking at our analytics and a bunch of you don't subscribe to the channel. We love you guys, but come on, shoot us some love, subscribe. Button's right there, super easy. Also, come find us on Twitter. You can find the show at TestTube. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. I really appreciate it. Love talking to you guys out there about our show and about the other shows that we do here at Discovery. So thanks so much. We'll see you next time on TestTube Plus. Mm -hmm.